Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Well, it looks as though we've taken another step towards a cashless society, and uh, I want everybody from Australia to uh, comment down in the comment section how prominent is this? How many banks in Australia have gone cashless percentage-wise? Because they don't say it's every single bank. Of course, you can still get cash from ATMs, but uh, well, anyway, I'm going to just play you guys this clip. Listen to this. We've taken another step towards a cashless society. A big bank has confirmed customers in some locations can no longer withdraw money over the counter as branches continue to wind back services. It's up there with the pub with no beer, the bank with no cash. ANZ has confirmed some branches no longer handle cash at the counter. Others are directing customers to smart ATMs for cash transactions. ANZ says only 8% of its customers rely solely on branches. NAB says for its customers, it's only 3%. The number of bank branches nationally dropped 30% in major cities over five years, from more than 3,000 to around 2,300. It's um, closed down at, oh, about 12 months ago, so I've got to come down to South Melbourne. And uh, if that closes down, I don't know where I've got to go, so for checks and everything else. It's a worldwide trend, and there are concerns it hurts disadvantaged customers the most. Senior citizens, new migrants, people who are disabled, they do need, if you like, face-to-face -face help. There's a danger here of excluding some elements of our society when we talk about inclusion all the time. The latest figures on ATMs shows the number of machines has more than halved, from almost 14,000 back in 2017 to around 6,000 in the middle of last year. I would point out to people that cash is still very important, both as a means of payment, because if you're paying by cash, you don't get surcharged. Emma O'Sullivan, 7 News. They are great resetting us every which way they can. In Canada too, I know they've also uh, done this where certain banks, uh, certain bank branches, I shouldn't say certain banks, but certain bank branches just aren't dealing in cash. Now, if you go to another bank branch, uh, you can in fact talk to a teller and get cash, but it is not every single branch anymore. And you heard it here in this clip, uh, you know, the irony is that they're trying to promote inclusion, but uh, they're actually excluding certain segments of the population by doing this. John David down here saying, we are getting closer to central bank digital currencies. That's close to the end game and how they will direct your spending patterns. Um, yeah, it's getting kind of scary. I don't know how many of you guys are from Australia. If you do have an opinion, please do put it down in the comments section. You can also tag me at Working Money CH on Twitter. I wanted to thank James just for letting us know about that recent update. The world obviously is becoming more digital and uh, we're seeing this with regards to not just banking partnerships, but other groups too. The annual shareholders meeting for Oceanus Group notes that their Agritech, Agritech specifically, their payment platform is suspected to use Ripple's on-demand liquidity. And uh, Rath Economy did a little bit of research here. It says uh, that it is not live yet. So this was from uh, April, if you guys remember the uh, April announcement. Well, first I'll just go over this. Is Odin currently online? So the Oceanus Digital Network is not online yet. Odin is a platform which form part of the whole ecosystem and it is likely to go online by the end of this year. Now, back in April, Rath Economist posted this. Ripple now lists Oceanus as a partner on their landing page. They were announced as an ODL partner in November. Who is Oceanus and why would they use an XRP using product? Start slow but gets very interesting towards the end. Let me go over this with you guys real quickly. Let's get this out of the way up front. The preceding pick is from their 22 annual report, as uh, most of the info is. They went nuts with the Ripple theme, but they are an aqua farm, so uh, it seems fitting, of course. Uh, they are a small global food tech company listed on the SGX, established known for aquaculture, farming, processing, packaging, and distribution of seafood products. Ripple announced a number of these cross-border food trade companies as ODL users. So these guys are ODL users, but uh, they're in the agricultural space. And uh, Rath Economy here just reposted a tweet that he originally tweeted out back in February. 2022, though, was a big year for Oceanus. First sales rose dramatically, uh, about 63%, but so did costs given FX challenges, among others. They lost money expanding as Infra grew and their product line expanded. 
Uh, but the big news for Ripple is an all-in tech effort launching Oceanus Digital Network, synergizing the capabilities of subsidiaries on one platform. A managed marketplace solution helps sellers alleviate struggles by eliminating cross-border trading and friction risks. So you guys can see here through Odin Pay, guys leveraging ODL financing, domestic and cross-border payments, competitive exchange rates, route to market solution for suppliers, distribution here in the center, food production, services. It's all going to be transacting worldwide on their Odin network, which is going to leverage ODL for liquidity. So fast forward to today, and they're saying it's not online yet. I think it's only a matter of time before we see them running on RippleNet leveraging XRP. Anyway, wanted to thank the Wrath of Kahneman for posting that. We got an update too from Ripple revealing their plans to deepen engagement with Hong Kong's blockchain community. As you guys know, they're working on a uh, an e version, an electronic version of the Hong Kong dollar running on the XRPL. And this is in conjunction with tokenizing real estate. Well, now they, uh, they posted this. Okay, Ripple has revealed its plans to engage with Hong Kong's vibrant developer community and burgeoning blockchain investments. This announcement was made via a post on August the 9th, so just a couple of days ago, the blockchain firm posted a video in which Kirit Bhatia, the Senior Director of Business Development at Ripple, highlighted Hong Kong's enduring significance as a bustling global financial hub and the significant presence of developers and blockchain-associated investments within the Hong Kong ecosystem. Uh, an important focal point of Bhatia's message was the growing adoption of cryptocurrencies in Hong Kong. He emphasized that the city has firmly established itself as a thriving hub for blockchain developers and investment activities. Drawing from his personal and professional experiences in Hong Kong, Badia shared significant milestones and resonated with the city's progress. According to him, Ripple's enthusiasm to collaborate with local businesses and financial institutions is an all-in pursuit of introducing a new epoch of value movement and tokenization. So it looks as though Ripple's really excited to be uh, working in Hong Kong. It's also going to encompass the wider Asian region. Batia also emphasized the strategic alliance between Ripple and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. That was the news we got uh, last month or uh, maybe two months ago now. Also their partnership with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So uh, great news there, guys. More development in Hong Kong. The e-dollar and the tokenized real estate, that was big uh, from a few weeks ago, but also looking to just expand the ecosystem in general. So great news there coming out of Hong Kong. We got some more Hong Kong news too with regards to Ripple partner Finastra, automated system holdings with Ripple partner Finastra and a company called ASL, Automated System Holdings, a global IT solutions and services provider, has strategically partnered with Finastra, a global provider for financial software applications and marketplaces, to bolster its industry-specific DevSecOps business and strengthen its fintech trajectory. Under this partnership, ASL has become the sole authorized service provider for Finastra's Condor solution in Hong Kong and Macau. As ASL continues to build its industry specialization, this collaboration enables ASL to provide managing services to financial institutions, investing in Condor, Finastra's comprehensive off-the-shelf front-to-back risk treasury solution. That was a mouthful. Uh, with ASL's expertise in application development, cybersecurity, and 24-7 omni-channel managed services, the partnership ensures the seamless integration and smooth operation of Condor for its clients. So we're seeing slowly but surely, uh, not so directly, but indirectly, Ripple is able to permeate China through Hong Kong amid favorable fintech policies including the Chinese government's fintech development plan and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority's fintech 2025 strategy, ASL is well positioned to reinforce its strong presence in the fintech sector. With Hong Kong being one of the Asia Pacific region's key fintech hubs, this partnership enables ASL to expand its reach and venture into the Greater Bay Area. The partnership integrating Finastra's Condor system with ASL's managing services marks a promising milestone in the evolution of fintech and open banking sector. And there are a few quotes here from the CEOs involved. I will link this in the description if you guys want to read the full thing. Just check this out though. ASL over the last two decades have harnessed the power of technology to deliver end-to-end -end IT managed services with industry-specific focus, driving businesses in the Asia Pacific and managing over 160,000 devices and 220,000 users globally. So a big market there, but uh, you know, even that is just a fraction of what is possible. Now they're teaming up with Finastra Again, a Ripple-enabled partner. So this is uh, more great news coming out of Hong Kong, whether it's through Ripple directly or through Ripple-enabled partners. We are seeing XRP utility grow, guys, in the Asia-Pacific region. So again, some great news there. 
Moving along though, yesterday I did a video on Ripple joining the bank for International Services Payment Task Force. And if you guys didn't see that video, I will link it up here in the top right hand corner. I just wanted to reiterate this because uh, somebody else brought up a good point, which I'm going to share with you guys in a second. So just kind of wanted to give you guys the gist again, just as a refresher, the Bank for International Settlements recently announced a cross-border payment interoperability and extension task force that includes blockchain digital payments network Ripple. And so, uh, you know, that is significant considering it's the Bank for International Settlements. And uh, I mean, we know that their partnership goes back several years. Nevertheless, one of the things that we did not address yesterday was this, okay? Let me just uh, give you guys some context. On August 9th, BIS shared a summary of its PI Task Force May 11th meeting in which it says that the members of the task force will work to enhance cross-border payments and meet the quantitative targets for cross-border payments endorsed by the G20. Payments endorsed by the G20. Remember that, guys. Remember that. Because it is significant. I know we've heard about the partnerships with, uh, for example, the Bank of England. But G20 engagement, I think we are maybe taking for granted a little bit. John Kiff here posted this. Okay, today's FinTech Digest includes the Bank of England reaching out for central bank digital currency. So a CBDC. And also signs that Ripple is moving off the G20 blacklist. Now, if we are to believe the conspiracies about ETHgate, American banks and the SEC trying to delay Ripple and XRP from being integrated into a new, broader financial system, well, then we should take in consideration what Kiff uh, writes down here in his blog, okay? He talks about Ripple joining the BIS uh, cross-border payment task force. The crypto press has discovered that Ripple is part of a task force convened by the Bank for International Settlements, as we know, uh, for cross-border payments, interoperability, and extension, the Pi task force. That does seem to be a big deal, but not for the reasons we were all talking about yesterday. He says it's because Ripple has been persona non grata in any international forums in which the United States government plays a key role on account of the firm's ongoing legal dispute between the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission. So basically stating now we are seeing Ripple's presence or rather the reintroduction into these conversations being held by G7 countries. Over the course of the lawsuit, we were seeing a lot of Ripple integration into the Middle East, into Southeast Asia, uh, you know, even into Africa. We even got inclinations that Russia may be piloting RippleNet. But guys, it's the G7 connection that is the big deal here. So a very astute observation by John Kiff here on Twitter. Wanted to thank him for mentioning that. Remember, back in 2020, Marcus Treacher said Ripple was focused on working with Central Blockchain to send ISO 20022 payments. Of course, at that time, they did not know that the SEC was going to sue them. Listen to what Marcus Treacher was saying before the whole debacle ever happened. Yes, certainly. Um, thanks for the uh, um, question. I think looking at the payment standards globally, there's kind of an elephant in the room, which is that the current standards um, network or the current standards people use around the world really is very fragmented and not fit for purpose. So to enable payments to become really effective and to do you know, really good service for the global economy and society, you really got to rethink um, how we go about standardizing information, how we go about making a payment really come to life so that the information around the transaction, around the underlying activities, is uh, communicated with a payment instruction. So I think, again, in the area that we're looking at very, very deeply at Ripple and we're deploying very quickly with um, super banks worldwide, is to create payments which are lived along with a very strong ISO 2022 compliant block of information which through blockchain can be recorded in an irrefutable way uh, forever and that really enables uh, you know banks and payment companies to kind of rethink how they communicate payment information between each other in a way that makes it much easier for people and companies to receive money to pay money in a transparent way cross-border um, with a very clear record and that you know it's good for everybody it um, reduces um, the risk of financial crime and uh, misuse of financial system source and we think if we work this way and we can develop these standards in this way then it, it takes out enormous costs from the payment industry because you're able to do you know, compliance checking conformity to um, um, oversight requirements really at source rather than have to kind of lay the as layers of cost and inefficiency over you know very old payment so it's really about um, redefining the underlying rails and making them super open super clear and super standard globally, and then you can really develop the payment network globally.
So giving the lowdown on how Ripple is focused on working with central banks, the ISO 20022 standard, uh, still relatively new at that point in time. This was before the lawsuit was announced, so it could not have been known how delayed this was going to get. But guys, we're seeing a bit of a sea change now. G20 central banks now becoming warmer, perhaps, to the possibility because XRP is now classified as a non-security in the United States. We also had Raul Advani here. Talking about regulation, guys, this one from 801 XRP. Listen up, G20 in September crypto, stablecoin, GSC, CBDC, and cross-border payment regulation recommendations. Ripple executive waiting for it too. The FATF standard, FATF working with GSSB, like FSB, IOSCO, BCBS, the BIS, and the IMF. Don't worry about the lawsuit that was to buy time to get everyone on board before developed countries adopted and implemented the new system. So he retweeted out Cyprus Dominant Core here's tweet. Ripple executive just a few weeks ago, guys, mentioned global regulation well positioned to pick up in September 2023 and how we should see more global regulation come into play a year or so. The timeline have been projected multiple times and people are choosing to ignore it, guys. This is Rahul Advani from Ripple, Blockchain Fintech Week from a few weeks ago. Listen to this. On policy recommendations for crypto and digital asset markets, uh, additionally, the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors are looking to establish standards for a global uh, digital asset regulatory framework, and we expect initial proposals around September of 2023. So we expect that you know the global regulatory bodies will continue to develop uh, frameworks over the next year or so. So September 2023, getting into quarter four of 2023, eyeing this specific timeline for more G20 integration, maybe it was a bit of a strategy for Ripple to integrate with the rest of the world first, to use it almost as a test ground to see how it would run without the West, then slowly onboard Western nations. The G20 connection, I gotta say honestly, did uh, did not even occur to me until Kif here pointed it out. Ripple has been persona non grata in all these international forums while they were under the SEC's thumb. But guys, things are going to change. The US banking sector is transforming before our eyes. That's just my opinion, but I wanna hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.